Thanks for tuning into Mutual Fund Show. I'm Neeraj Shah. We're talking about a particular sect of mutual funds, the multi-asset category. And in the recent times, there is a bit of an activity that has crept up in this space for technical reasons. But the last 12 months, we've seen a number of people come in and talk about uh, the importance of exposure or the importance of having the multi-asset fund category as a part of the court portfolio core portfolio, especially for people who do not have the time and the expertise to balance out their mutual fund portfolio into equity, into debt, and into other asset classes. And here's where the category does the trick for you. So we thought it best to get in um, an AMC, which has uh, built out a recent multi-asset product and try and understand from them, how do they look at the category and how do they look at their fund within that category? Uh, the two gentlemen from White Oak, Capital AMC, Ashish Somaya, uh, CEO of the AMC needs no introduction, been with us a number of times. Ashish, great having you. you. And for the first time on the MF show and on BQ Prime, Chirag Patel, co head of products at White Oak Capital AMC. Chirag, great having you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. No, no, the pleasure is entirely ours. So let's start with um, uh, this, this category itself. There is a bit of an activity, as you told me in an email, maybe because of some tax changes as well, but it's now being spoken about for the last six to nine odd months. Tell us why have you guys thought of a fund in this category? So, you know, the, uh, for us, the genesis of creating this kind of fund or this, you know, entering this kind of product category was basically because if you ask me, I look at, you know, multi-asset allocation as per the regulatory definition. It says that uh, any fund which has a minimum of 10% exposure to at least three different asset classes will be called a multi-asset fund. Now, if you look at my asset allocation, from my perspective, it's more like chemistry, right? And even if you see this definition, which I told you, it means that you can mix any number of asset classes. Of course, regulation allowing you. If you can mix any number of asset classes, then obviously, why did I say it's chemistry? Is because when you mix these asset classes, you can mix them, of course, in varying proportions. The other important thing is that different asset classes, if you look at their returns profiles, mm -hmm. uh, they will have varying degrees of correlation. So say, for example, if you take large cap and mid cap and small cap, they are all within equity, they may move in tandem. Sometimes if you see equity and oil, they both are indicators of economic prowess, oil prices going up and stock markets booming. So they are sometimes positively correlated. But if you take Indian equity and gold, or if you take Indian debt and global equity, for instance, you will find that there is low or no correlation. The returns are random. They are not correlated at all. So what happens is that when you mix different asset classes together, you can arrive at a combination hmm. which can ultimately dampen the volatility and still allow the returns to play out. So for us, it is entirely this chemistry at play. We are trying to combine multiple asset classes such that over any three-year rolling period, three-year return rolling period, you should get the volatility like a short-term debt fund. And on a three-year rolling basis, the return profile uh, should be positive, uh, much higher than fixed income, hopefully. May not be as much as equity, but at least higher or comparable to fixed income or hybrid kind of uh, categories. So we set out to create this product to kind of achieve this combination. Mm -hmm. And then as you can imagine, what we are doing is we are taking the return profile, one year, three year, five year return profiles of different asset classes and then regressing them over multiple time frames and seeing that if you combine them in various proportions, then how would the return and volatility profile of such a combination play out? And then on that, you're adding another layer of complexity, saying that at different bends on the road, how you would rebalance uh, these combinations. So we kind of done all that homework. Of course, Chirag is responsible for it. We've done all that back testing and homework and arrived at a combination, which will give us you know volatility comparable to a debt fund, but the potential for return much higher than a debt fund. That's what we are trying to achieve with this. Okay. And before I get to the numbers, just one quick follow-up, Ashish. Uh, is the, I mean, this is a new thing in India, but I'm just trying to understand, is there a large global need for such a product? And uh, uh, maybe I should have asked this question at the end, but what kind of investors is something like this suited for? So, you know, uh, eventually when it comes to many, many walks in walks of life or in almost every walk of life, mm. you eventually realize that simplicity is the you know highest form of sophistication is simplicity right because what happens is that ultimately when people are investing what are people trying to achieve see we tell people that okay depending on your risk profile depending on your goals 
you should invest in asset if you're in equity you should need a long time horizon if you're in fixed income short term you know gold is for hedge against volatility global equity is for capturing other growth opportunities etc etc so you always tell people to asset allocate as per their go goals and return uh, risk tolerance with all of that ultimately on any asset allocated portfolio if you try to achieve all your goals and you set out a proper diversified portfolio what are you trying to do you are trying to have low volatility with some 10 12% return you will realize very quickly in life that if you try to go for 20% return then none of your short term goals will be met yeah. and if you try to keep your capital intact then you will never get growth so ultimately what are people trying to achieve everybody is trying to achieve a reasonable return with low volatility so that is why this kind of products at the back end what chirag does is very complex but at the front end it's not supposed to be as complex it's just yeah. supposed to give you a ready made asset allocation and globally this is the fastest growing category you know I, like if you take this source as say the bcg asset management report there's a global asset management report report published by boston consulting if you take last 2 3 years of reports you will find this category called solutions based products is the fastest growing category uh, globally okay okay so Chirag, now tell us uh, for somebody who is getting into this fund, and as Ashish said, that uh, uh, you guys were very clear that you wanted to have a good mix, judicious mix, if I can use that term, maybe not verbatim, but I, uh, I'm, I'm taking that as an implied meaning, uh, judicious mix of all the asset classes or the different asset classes. So, what does an investor get when she invests into a multi-asset fund from your stable or in, or in general? So, for example, now. generally typically a product is devised to you know you target at expected return and the volatility is the outcome mm -hmm. but here consider a fixed income investor or a debt mutual fund investor from him now the tax benefit has been taken away right he his first priority or primary goal is to have lower volatility right? okay and the yeah. secondary goal is return so how we devise design this product we have targeted at the volatility first so the volatility of the product should be not go beyond the threshold level mm -hmm. and try to optimize the return as a secondary objective so that is how we have started to design with the product so for example how to do it now right so how you can do it so for example to arrive at a blue color you require a various shades of blue color so you mix blue and white color so you get different shades so like you combine equity and debt so you can get different risk return profile but you can't go beyond certain permutation because you are having only two colors but i use three colors red yellow and blue you can have full range of colors so now consider all the possible asset class like equity gold foreign equity fixed income commodities and everything now you can create n number of return and risk profile so for example a typical bond volatility for last 15 year is 7% mm -hmm. 10 year bond volatility on a one year rolling basis right you take we take that volatility as a benchmark so our volatility should be around that thing now you have to optimize the return so now you combine equity bond gold and various other asset class like foreign equity so how does it actually work so for example if i construct a 100% bond portfolio i get a 7% kind of volatility on an average if i add 10% equity to it what will happen right so generally the perception is the volatility should increase yes but actually it reduces because equity and debt is having negative correlation on a one year basis for example if i had gold to it the volatility further reduces because gold is having negative correlation with equity mm -hmm. and fixed income both now if you see the return profile of this investor equity is on higher side bond is on lower side and gold falls in between sure and they give return at different time in time the period, yeah, time yeah. frames so if you combine them judiciously i will arrive at the target volatility and then i try to optimize the return so that is what a typical bond investor or a mutual fund investor want from his investment hmm. okay. as ashish is also rightly mentioned that you know there are for any investor capital there are three buckets three mental bucket one is a personal risk bucket sure second is a market risk bucket and the third is the aspirational bucket now the personal risk bucket is the portion which is the maximum or the biggest part of anyone's portfolio because he don't want to sacrifice on his lifestyle sure right so he put maximum amount over there where generally people put money into debt traditional instrument debt mutual funds and other ncds and bonds then a market risk bucket comes where you have all equity fund etf index fund and then aspirational bucket which is very small part 
so if you invest into a startup or a venture capital wow. fund or crypto right? <laughs> your life will get changed if you get, if you are successful yeah, right, yeah. but if you are not, versa. <laughs> yes so there there goes very little amount so we are trying to optimize the biggest part of investor asset through this fund so which is a personal risk bucket got it okay um Ashish, just wondering, and, and again, actually a question to both of you, but I'll start off with you and you can supplement this. Uh, so how um, is, okay, let me let me rephrase, uh, actually, let me try and phrase my question properly. In the case of, a, let's say, a balanced advantage fund, typically, uh, the proportion would proportion of exposure to equity to debt, to debt would vary depending on the relative valuations. So out here, how is a typical multi-asset fund doing it? And how are you doing it differently? Because I presume that your proportions of exposure to equity to debt to other asset classes is a lot more balanced than yeah. uh, maybe otherwise. Yeah, more widespread. Yeah, but uh, so, you know, so you look at it this way, that each fund is created with a different thought process. If you see balanced advantage funds in India, or in fact, even if you see multi-asset allocation funds in the market, other than our fund, mm -hmm. what you will find is that Multi-asset as well as balanced advantage, both categories out here, other than ours, are actually created with a threshold criteria that they should meet taxation of equity. Hmm. If you recall what Chirag said a couple of minutes back, for us, when we started out, the threshold criteria was low volatility yeah. or volatility compared to fixed income. So when the starting point changes, then obviously which way the model will take you will change. So if I say threshold criteria of equity taxation means you can do arbitrage and all, but ultimately as an asset class, 65 to 70% money is directed to equity. So what is left is 30% debt. Now, like you rightly said, in a balance advantage fund, it gets calibrated up and down uh, the effective equity position because you will run short positions through arbitrage futures. So the effective equity position gets calibrated up and down, mm -hmm. but ultimately the fund is 65 to 70% equity mm -hmm. and the rest in debt. Yeah. Multi-asset allocation funds, unfortunately, before we came in, in the entire industry, there also, unfortunately, everybody has started with a threshold criteria, equity taxation. So again, 65% equity. So what remains is, you know, because equity also, you have to use futures and arbitrage. So you need margin money and stuff. So if you have 65 to 70% equity, then you're left with 20% debt. And then because it has to qualify as multi-asset, you have to put 10% gold because three asset classes is yeah. a must. So balance advantage funds and multi-asset allocation funds, both, uh, at least in our market, they all have threshold criteria of equity taxation and sure. hence the asset allocation is directed in that manner. And then according to me, it doesn't function like a multi-asset fund actually. Mm -hmm. So you have so only, you, you know, you're uh, saying that those 30% is not good enough to take care of the volatility oh yes, that yeah. should typically come in from a multiple asset portfolio. I'll just exemplify that with numbers. Let's take an example. Let us say if I were to tell you that Indian equity on a one-year rolling basis and gold on a one-year rolling return basis, if I'm not wrong, correct me. Let us say that their correlation is minus 0 0.2, example. Now, whenever you do this, you, you diversify for low correlation or no correlation, right? But that arithmetic is relevant if you're comparing one unit of equity with one unit of gold. Mm -hmm. If I say that Neeraj, uh, Indian equity and uh, in, uh, Indian gold prices have low correlation, that statement is relevant if I compare one unit of equity with one unit of gold. If I have seven units of equity and one unit of gold, sure. then the discussion on correlation, low correlation is a, uh, you know, infructuous. I mean, it makes no sense really. So that is why the mix has to be such that the correlations or lack of correlations should play out, right? I mean, they should have an equal footing yeah. and hence a chance to function. Uh, this is like, you know, rigged in favor of equity taxation ab initio. So then that 10% gold has no chance to save you. Okay. Just to add please, on please. Yeah. This. So for example, it's like, you know, you are driving a car. So acceleration is equity, brake. You want, you want to calibrate your speed based on traffic and turn. But still somebody can bump into your car. At that mm. time you require an airbag. So the airbag is gold. So if you have only one airbag, mm. how can you survive an accident like subprime or a COVID? Right. So that's why a good proportion of every asset class should be there. So that is what is the heck. Actually, the model should be un unfettered. It should be unfettered model and then you optimize it. Sure. But if I put some overriding criteria that 
you can make the model as you wish but it has to have this taxation or this return then it won't work right yeah i i guess, I guess well in, in concept or in theory it makes it more attractive to tell people as well that it's a multi asset fund with equity taxation because the lower taxation rules apply out here right in in in, in that way if indeed the equity proportion is higher than 65% or 70%. Yeah, if equity proportion is higher than 65-70%, it will be more attractive on taxation. Right. But it will you are saying it won't expose serve the you to extremes. Sure. See, yeah. uh, one of the one of the benefits of having a multi-asset allocation fund is that whenever there is March 2020 or whenever otherwise there is October 2021. Sure. In both cases, it won't expose you to extremes. See, one of the learnings of all this behavioral science is that people react emotionally when they're exposed to extremes. So the only way not to make investment mistakes is to make sure your emotions don't surface. Yeah. And for that, you should never be in a product which exposes you to extremes. So that sure. is also something to keep in mind. And talking of taxation here, it's not like we have really compromised heavily on that tax part because mm -hmm. it's an optimization game. So under the new tax regime, the way we are structuring the fund, it will land up between 35% equity and 65% equity. Mm -hmm. So this kind of fund, if you hold for three years, it qualifies as a long-term asset. And hence, the taxation as per current regime is 20% less indexation factoring. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, if you bear with me for the arithmetic, let us say like to like, if you are in an equity taxation, let's say at the end of three years, you know, you keep getting 8-9% compounded. Let's say our kind of product, if it gives 8-9% compounded in three years, let's say you reach 130. And let's say like to like you compare equity also reaches 130. Now in three years in equity on 30, you're going to pay 10% plus per surcharge, let's say three, three and a half rupees. In this kind of structuring, let's say 100 goes to 130, 118 is the index cost because of cost inflation. So your gain is, let's say 12, I'm assuming 6% inflation. So 119, 120 is the index cost. So 130 less 120, you have gain of 10 bucks. On 10 bucks, you will pay 20% plus surcharge. So you will pay some two, two and a half rupees. So it's not like uh, it is, see a lot of times if equity gives higher return, sure, sure, sure. then you have higher return and you know, fine. But if you compare like to like, this hybrid taxation is not bad. Got it's it. quite and, attractive. And, 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 and the fact remains that the product is for a particular kind of an investor. If the investor wants a higher equity exposure, there are other products yeah, to choose from. Yeah. No okay. Doubt. No doubt. I have one final question and that's to you, um, Chirag, which is, uh, uh, the so I, I saw in the in the deck that I got as well that there is a bit of back testing that has happened. So for somebody, let's say this investor, she's listening to you right now and Ashish right now, and she's convinced that she wants to invest money in the multi asset fund. Your, what does the back testing say in terms of the kind of returns that it would have come up if this product would have been launched a few years back? Are there some numbers around that? So for example, we have done back testing for last 11, 12 years. Okay. And as we have targeted at specified volatility. So the asset range would be like, you know, equity should be between say 15 to 45 net equity, gross equity would be 35, gold should be between 10 to 40, debt should be between 10 to 55, and then rest is into foreign equity. So when we do a technical rebalancing based on various valuation parameters, so for example, you know, different asset class exhibit different volatility different during different economic cycles. Sure. So in, in, in for example, in case of uh, when there is a recovery, equity will do well. When there is a boom, commodity will do well. When there is a slowdown, right, the bond will do well. And when there is a recession, gold yeah. will do well. So see, when we do, did the back testing, the average volatility of the product has been close to 7%. Okay. And sometimes lower than that. Mm -hmm. And the average return that an investor may get on a three-year rolling basis is 11% kind of. Oh, okay. That is that is on gross basis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely the expense and transaction oh, cost would be there, but which would be still a good product for a conservative investor. Basically, these back, tests, back tests, obviously, you know, uh, there are a few things to keep in mind that back tests, obviously, uh, like he rightly said, it's showing the gross numbers, number one. Number two, from our perspective, any product that you try to create and envisage a situation, you are actually hypothesizing of the uh, potential. Yeah. So back tests only tell us that, okay, this hypothesis is workable. But I would urge that nobody should invest just based on the uh, back test. I think that is something important. To yeah, keep in but mind. since there are no comparable parameters, I just yes. thought it's good to get an indicative idea of what could have happened. 
it's and a very good working data to know that okay exactly. this hypothesis can work and this is how it plays out under different market conditions yeah, great but it's an it's an important and interesting product as a lot of people have said and therefore i'm very happy that more and more of such funds are coming um and you are true to label i wish you all the best with that and thank you so much for being with us uh, in our studios i might add and talking to us on the mutual fund show thank you thanks for having us now um it's good to uh, get in somebody who's advising investors on what does she make of this category um and what proportion of your mutual fund portfolio if at all could be in that category according to her shweta jain founder of investography joins us right now on the show shweta great having you thanks for taking the time out thanks for having me raj the pleasure is ours shweta uh, we just speaking to ashish somaya and chirag patel about uh, Uh, the multi asset offering from the white oak capital stable before i get to the specifics about different multi asset funds just trying to understand do you believe multi asset funds as a category uh, become a core part of a portfolio or not necessarily so so i don't believe it can be a core part of the portfolio but i do believe that it can be a part of your portfolio okay could you explain uh, so multi asset funds are funds that have investments in three or more categories of asset classes and in each of them uh, at least a 10% minimum investment this is sebi uh, classification right so at any point of time the investor may not know where his entire funds are invested if this is the core part of the portfolio so for somebody who is looking at investing in a fund that is a uh, stable that is less volatile that has equity and has these different asset classes uh this could be a good category for them but not necessarily for everybody and this could be a smaller part of somebody's portfolio not necessarily the core i believe the core should be what one really wants with their money so whether it's equity for long term or a uh, debt for short term uh then this that could be the core part but for this reason i don't believe that a multi asset fund could be a core part of the portfolio okay uh, the the argument shweta um, could be that uh, when when back tested over the last 12 13 years uh for which white oak has done and maybe some other amcs have done which i have spoken in the past their argument is that if you look at the back tested model then the volatility adjusted or the risk reward adjusted returns of about 9 to 10% as the case may be uh provide you a really good bang for the buck for the kind of low volatility that these funds give and therefore they are a great hedge against major volatile volatile events part one and uh, they give you this steady state 9 10% which is a good return so uh is there a reason why there should not be a larger proportion of multi asset funds in the portfolio See, it's uh, easier to say that you know when back tested, this is what has happened. Uh, but we don't work in hindsight, right? We are looking forward. So what has worked in the past will not necessarily work in the future. Okay. Uh, having said that, when the client cannot control what kind of asset allocation his core portfolio has, because the client actually does not have control over the portfolio, right? It's the fund manager who's going to take these calls. So when they don't have the kind of control that they should be having, ideally over their portfolio i don't believe that this can be a core part of the portfolio of course it it's a great addition for somebody's portfolio for exactly the reasons that mentioned yeah. right um, lesser volatility um, higher stability and that's exactly what i pointed out right in the beginning that you know this with this low volatility you get good returns and that's a great addition to the portfolio uh, for a long term but because you don't know at any point of time how much exposure you might have to gold uh, for example or a debt for example you don't know what your asset allocation is and if you would want liquidity in the next couple of years you can't uh, withdraw this core uh, a part of this core portfolio right you can't just withdraw the debt part and say you know let the equity part grow for that you will still need to manage your cash flows according uh, to that portfolio so you will need a portfolio which is suited to your needs uh, but like i said this is a great addition i do believe Okay, fair call. Now uh, I have one specific question, if you will. Uh, so um, uh, the okay, the the f- in, in select funds, uh, Shweta, uh, even though they might be multi-asset funds or they are multi-asset funds, the exposure of 
the the equity component is fairly high to uh, quote unquote take advantage of the equity taxation uh, yeah. and in maybe one case like these or some others uh, it's maybe a bit more true to label in that it's well balanced out between the different asset yeah. classes to give the true to label exposure really uh, what would you have as a preference part one and if you've looked at the few multi asset funds on offer in india uh, do you recommend something and if so why uh, so it's interesting right um, when somebody has uh, these two very different um, sort of boxes in the same category and you are comparing the returns it's actually not fair to even compare the returns which somebody has um, for example i'm not uh, can i name names of course you should. I... yeah we, we, we would love for if so, you are comfortable please do okay so for example an icici uh, multi asset has uh, higher equity uh, and uh, has the advantage of taxation here right so for long term it's uh, treated as, treated as equity um, but it's predominantly equity, right? 65% or more of the portfolio has to be equity. So it leaves very little uh, for them to actually diversify into say gold uh, and debt, right? So it's, uh, for me, then that's uh, something while taxation may be a positive, it's not really a great place for me to diversify. On the other hand, something like a Motilal Oswal, uh, which launched its multi-asset a, a, a year or so ago, um, also has, uh, the same category, but very different treatment, right? It, it's treated as a debt fund uh, and it has uh, foreign equity as well. Uh, it has debt, it has gold, it has domestic equity. So then it's more true to label. And that's why I, do, I can't really compare the returns between a Moti Lal Oswal uh, uh, and uh, an ICSA equity for a multi, a multi asset for it, uh, that matter, right? So for me, uh, I would stick to something which is more diversified rather than something which is treated as equity See, it's uh, it's an easier sell i think for uh, uh, people that you know it's uh, treated as equity and uh, the capital gains will be accordingly so you know we get a little bit of gold a little bit of uh, debt and uh, it's a stable fund uh, also the disadvantage i think uh, which works against the truly diversified or truly multi asset funds is that when you compare them to Nifty, right, just the returns, they will fall short uh, over uh, the benchmark, right, uh, depending on how the markets have done. Uh, but they will at times fall short of that, and that may work against them. So while they're uh, true to label and uh, they might be doing fantastic and add a great addition to the portfolio, that will work against them because at the end of the day, the uh, investor is going to compare uh, returns in the same category of funds and uh, you know be like okay so it's this is better than that rather than actually get into more details i would go with uh, a more true diversified uh, multi-asset fund lovely talking to you thank you so much for these insights and thanks for being a part of the mutual fund show thank you for having me <laughs> okay and viewers thanks for tuning into this leg of the mutual fund show